Well, welcome everyone. This is John, your former program director, JOD to most of you. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming to this event and welcome uh, to the University of Pittsburgh Nurse Anesthesia Program discussion about ultrasound initiatives. And I've invited here tonight um, four of our graduates and soon to be graduates uh, who have been doing work through their DMP programs on ultrasound. Uh, there's Dr. Jared Northcott, uh, Dr. Daryl DeLima, Dr. Betsy Gajawa, and Dr. Shawnez Morris, who actually hasn't completed the program, but she's already presented and um, defended her DMP project. And so she has earned that title. Um, and so I thought that I would just welcome you. And I wanted you to know that that Maddie Dix, who is our, our um, recruiter and our PR uh, expert from our School of Nursing is recording this session. And if you have any questions or thoughts about what we're talking about, then you can uh, put those into the chat and uh, Maddie will make sure that we get a chance to answer them. Uh, without further ado, let me just start the talk. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I thought that I would share is that we've, we've established a goal for our nurse anesthesia program to do more work in ultrasound education. And the reason that that is so important is, is multiple fold. Uh, first, ultrasound is going to be and is now part of typical nurse anesthesia practice. And so we need to make sure that we as a program stay up with current practice trends. Uh, two, as the years have gone by, we, we have realized that um, we really need to give our students that skill set prior to their graduation. And for those of you who are on, who feel like perhaps uh, while you were in the program, we didn't have much emphasis, that, that is true. And primarily that was because we simply didn't have the equipment within the school to do that education. So what you got was what you received when you were in the clinical uh, rotations. Um, one of the things uh, that I wanted to talk about, we've had three DMP pro uh, cohorts graduating now, about 120 students. Uh, we Our program is still about 85 credits over nine semesters. And in seven out of those nine clinical semesters, um, the students are getting cases and we still require substantially more than the ANA requires. So we require 800 cases and more than 2000 hours. Uh, our students exceed these numbers uh, greatly and we're seeing more and more that they're doing ultrasound work during that. Um, the completion of the DMP project, and you're gonna hear about four different projects here tonight, uh, has to be by the term eight out of nine. And Jared, that was a change that we made after your class graduated. And I think you would agree that it was a, it was a problem trying to study for boards while you were actually trying to finish that project. And so uh, we think it's important now that we just simply insist on that because we want that final term to be in preparation for the national cert exam. Um, we have a total of 125 students because, and I'm counting these as FTEs, it's real like more like 130 if we didn't count the FTEs, uh, but um, the MSN and DMP students are typically part-time. So we have about 125 full-time um, FTE students in the program. With our historical national cert exam pass rates, still doing really well. And we've been doing well in that area since I became director of the program. Uh, we have uh, these faculty within the program now. We've had a little bit of faculty change and that's something that we're working to address. Um, but as you can see, um, we've got 10 faculty here. One who might not be very familiar to all of you is Dr. Karen Warner. Uh, not a CRNA, but a process expert who helps with our DMP work. And then Dr. Faison Song, uh, who is a tenure stream CRNA faculty, uh, but doesn't do a whole lot of teaching within the program. Um, we now have more than 500 CRNAs who work with us as preceptors. Uh, UPMC alone has more than 600 um, uh, CRNAs working, uh, and most of them spend time working with their students, and we have a large number of anesthesiologists. Um, and as far as this ultrasound work, uh, these initiatives, initiatives really started about three years ago 
uh, when I established the goal that we would do more ultrasound work uh, as a program. And so we conducted some alumni fundraising. Perhaps some of you donated. I thank you for that. Um, Wiser has purchased a really great system for point of care ultrasound, which is now an ANA accreditation standard, as is for regional anesthesia, as is for vascular access. And so it's not just that it's a practice change, but it's also an accreditation standard change. Uh, and so uh, we think that this is very important. I've raised about $100,000 so far, primarily purchasing um, uh, ultrasound devices and ultrasound, ultrasoundable uh, part task simulators. So for example, we have adductor canal simulators and paravertebral block simulators now, and a, and a wide range of other simulators for various blocks. Uh, and not only have we spent this alumni donation money, but we've also been receiving monies from the uh, Pennsylvania Association to the tune of, of um, $40,000 over the last three years. And uh, we primarily spent that again on ultrasound support. Uh, we have a number of ultrasound uh, devices. We have a Sonosite butterfly for practice with IVs. Uh, we have two GE50 venue ultrasound machines, state-of-the-art machines that include uh, Doppler and color Doppler to boot, as well as Wiser purchasing for 50,000 each uh, five high-end Sonosite systems with really large uh, and high-definition screens for the purposes of, um, of doing more ultrasound work for providers across our health system. With our GE systems, we also purchased a large number of various ultrasound probes so that we could do everything from a small digit examination of vasculature to uh, actually being able to do cardiac uh, exams and things along those lines. And we've now, developed a variety of, model of ultrasound courses at Wiser as DMP projects. And uh, one thing you might note, if you're within system and have access to Wiser as an account, uh, th those courses are gonna be renamed. You're gonna see them under USAPP, which is Ultrasound for Advanced Practice Providers. Uh, we did that for a couple of reasons. One, we're not the only group that needs to learn how to use ultrasound. Uh, the, the PAs and MPs also need that. Uh, but also it gives our students, if they're doing DMP projects, a wider pool of individuals to work with when they're doing programs. Uh, and so we thought it was important that we actually um, uh, change the name of the course to make it a broader application. And these are some of the probes that we've purchased. Um, the first uh, panelist that I'd like to introduce is Dr. Jared Northcott. And Jared was one of the students who graduated with our very first DMP class in 2019. So Jared. Thank you. Um, like Dr. O'Donnell mentioned, uh, my name is Jared Northcott. Um, I graduated as the first DMP class there, uh, December of 2019. Um, currently uh, practice at Meadville Medical Center uh, in Meadville, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been with them since graduation. Um, we work under the group Anesthesia Consultants of Meadville. Uh, we staff uh, the main hospital there in Meadville. Uh, they have five ORs there plus OB. Um, we also have a surgery center um, that has seven ORs uh, that we also staff, uh, a GI lab and a pain clinic there also, um, as well as Titusville Hospital. Um, and Titusville is a little bit unique for us in that um, it's staffed as CRNA only. Um, so we go over as CRNAs and do all the cases there independently. Um, and we also take call there in Titusville. Um, in our practice there, I would say we do on the realm of at least 20 to 30 regional blocks a week. Um, not that I myself do all of those blocks, um, but they, uh, they being us as CRNAs are encouraged to do all the blocks. Um, we do lower extremity blocks, um, the IPAC block, adductor canal, uh, sciatic femoral blocks. And again, these are all uh, ultrasound guided. Um, upper extremity blocks for shoulders and elbows and distal radius fractures and things of that sort. Um, we'll do interscaling and superclad blocks um, with that. 
Uh, also, all of our A lines uh, get placed under ultrasound, um, as well as uh, some of our difficult IV access as well. So that's a little bit of background in, in uh, my experience so far uh, in my practice. And uh, it, it's been really good because um, the docs and, and everyone really encourages CRNAs to, to learn and do all the blocks. So you can go ahead and advance. Um, as far as uh, DNP projects go, um, my uh, DNP project title was the development and implementation of ultrasound guided peripheral IV insertion training program for CRNAs to improve success rates in perioperative patients. Um, this program was implemented at McGee uh, Hospital, Wounds Hospital down there in Pittsburgh. Um, really with the goal of here was to to develop and implement this training program that allowed the CRNAs to use ultrasound um, to assist with difficult IV access patients. Um, we looked at you know, patients that were deemed difficult sticks. And again, the overall goal was to reduce and minimize the number of attempts that we had per patients, because you can imagine you know, difficult stick patients coming in and getting stuck three or four times. Uh, we were trying to, to minimize that down to, to just one attempt that they if, if we knew that they were a difficult stick coming in. Um, let's see. Yeah, so again, you know, we developed the, the training program uh, in conjunction with Wiser there and as well as uh, McGee Women's Hospital. Um, we developed and then implemented this program. Uh, we used a pre uh, post assessment and we looked at um, the total number of attempts, uh, whether we were successful in cannulating or not, um, the total time that it took for the procedure to take place, and then really the provider comfort, uh, both pre and post, uh, as well as their, their confidence in, in using ultrasound and just uh, having that to guide uh, the peripheral IV catheters into the vein. Um, as I kind of mentioned before, we used a blended curriculum here. Uh, there was an online module portion uh, that, that we developed the, that had various slides showing anatomy, um, as well as uh, ultrasound use and different probes. Um, and then we incorporated that with uh, an in situ simulation training um, to kind of take the users through start to finish from uh, inserting a peripheral IV with the uh, ultrasound. Uh, we looked at their pre and post uh, course knowledge. Um, we assessed that and kind of did a, did a co comparison there um, as well as confidence. And then um, looked at their baseline versus uh, post course uh, results. And just to kind of de determine, you know, whether the, the program that we came up with was effective or not. Uh, at teaching these users to use ultrasound. And, and Jared, if you wouldn't mind just describing what in situ simulation training is for everyone who maybe isn't as familiar with the different simulation modes. Sure. So the, the in situ portion of the simulation, again, we, were, we did this at McGee Women's Hospital. So the in situ portion would be at whatever site they're practicing at. Um, so, you know, like I said, in this case, we, we took the simulation to McGee um, which made it much easier to um, obtain learners. I mean, because you can imagine trying to do this on an OR scheduled day, um, it's hard enough to get people to come in off hours, um, but it, we were able to incorporate this during, during a regular day and people were able to get out on breaks, um, you know, if they, or they had extra hands, we were able to, to, to get people to come in and actually participate and, and be able to to do this training. Um, so that was very, one of the, one of the more helpful parts uh, of being able to kind of be mobile and actually go in situ. Um, so what we found um, was that it did in fact uh, increase uh, CRNA knowledge um, and obviously, or definitely confidence. Um, we had great feedback on the course. Um, you know, they wanted more, um, this, project was kind of a springboard uh, for a lot of other projects, I think, uh, uh, that came after. Um, they were hoping to get a little more hands-on actually um, on patients and, and doing them. All of the stuff that we did was on uh, simulators. So um, 
you know, they were hoping to, to kind of go through an actual placement on, on a patient, um, but we weren't able to do, but uh, they, again, found it very helpful and the feedback was, was very positive. And um, you know, hopefully they're continuing um, with this uh, you know, since graduation, uh, well, up to graduation, uh, it seemed like all the feedback was very positive and they were actually able to use uh, ultrasound a, a few times uh, for peripheral IV insertion. And Jared, you'll be glad to know that we have three projects about to launch right now um, that are using the course that you developed. Great. And they're gonna be implemented again at McGee, but also at St. Margaret's and at Mercy Hospital. And um, one thing I think uh, that, that uh, we didn't anticipate from your project, because we trained a number of CRNAs, uh, but they, they, because how busy they are and because there wasn't a structure, I think, uh, for them to actually train others, uh, they didn't really train anybody else. And so now what we're following up with, we built a second course, which is for the instructor, the person that we train, they're now gonna be required to train other people so that we could actually get the ripple effect that we had planned to get everybody in the whole department trained. That's um, great. So you'll be glad to know that you started that whole cascade and we're hoping to be able to spread that across system. Yeah, I mean, as Dr. O'Donnell had mentioned, um, it is an essential skill for us to have as CRNAs. I mean, the amount of times that, that it, it, you use that skill and that it's, it really is the future. I mean, it is the standard, um, you know, coming out of the program, being able to use ultrasound and come in and, you know, kind of hit the ground running and be able to perform these blocks. Um, you know, that was a, a huge bonus. And, and I've used ultrasound to place IVs on difficult patients uh, a number of times. Um, so, I mean, just developing the, those skills with, with ultrasound and, and, and guiding needle is, is very important. I'm glad to hear this continuing. Yeah, it's, it's great. You did, I mean, in the course you, you developed is really high quality. So it makes it really nice for the follow-on students. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Daryl DeLima, um, also captain in the United States Army. Um, and Dr. DeLima is a graduate of our class of 2020. Daryl. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, sir. My name is uh, Daryl DeLima. Uh, I'm a class or a graduate of the class of 2020. I currently work at West Penn Hospital here in Pittsburgh uh, full time but I'm also uh, currently still in the Army Reserve. Um, I'm attached to one of the uh, four resuscitative surgical detachments in Twinsburg, Ohio. Um, and last fall from August to December, I was lucky enough to do a backfill assignment uh, to work as an active duty Army Sierra and a Triple Army Medical Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, this August, or sorry, this October, also I'll be deploying uh, again, also with the forward resuscitative surgical detachment to the uh, Operation Inherent Resolve uh, area of operations. So yeah, looking forward to all that. Um, at West Penn, we're ACT. You know, we have about 20 ORs, GI suites. We do OB there. We're one of the two burn centers, uh, Mercy being the other one. Um, I utilize ultrasound. They're primarily mostly for uh, our arterial line insertions, as well as uh, helping us in OB with uh, possibly difficult uh, epidural insertions and spinal insertions. And then when I was in Hawaii, uh, you know, working as an active duty CRNA, um, we were able to do everything from arterial line insertions to uh, difficult PIV starts to uh, nerve blocks over there. Um, since I don't really do nerve blocks here in Pittsburgh, I kind of kept it simple and just stuck to, um, you know, your inner scalenes, femoral adductor canal blocks. Uh, we were doing BKAs with, uh, you know, just peripheral nerve blocks and propofol drips, which I thought was pretty cool because I feel like here we pretty much do those all under GA. So just kind of using ultrasound and using different adjuncts, I thought was pretty cool to experience. 
Um, so my project was uh, called the development and implementation of an ultrasound training program to improve basic ultrasound knowledge and technical skills of anesthesia providers. And the purpose of my project was to address the need for a standardized uh, like curriculum for anesthesia providers, which includes CRNAs and SRNAs. Um, and then the goal of my project was to enhance their understanding of the ultrasound physics, as well as the proper use of the machines to include uh, the machine knobs, so the knobology, uh, and as well as to familiarize them with the different types of ultrasound probes, so the, the probology, and then um, you know, with the goal of improving their knowledge and their technical ability with that. All right, so yeah, so, uh, with my aims, um, like Dr. Neft was my project chair, and Dr. O'Donnell, uh, served on my DNP committee as well. And they kind of had this vision of creating like a formal ultrasound training curriculum for uh, peripheral nerve block instruction. Uh, so my project was supposed to be the foundation where the participants are taught the basics of the ultrasound use. Um, like the SRNAs from the subsequent classes uh, were supposed to take over and do um, or teach like specific blocks um, and they kind of followed my curriculum to kind of base their uh, their teaching program. And then also Dr. O'Donnell wanted me to incorporate my program <clears throat> at the Winter Institute of Simulation Education and Research, or WISER, and then uh, to open it to the CRNAs and the other uh, advanced practice uh, dis disciplines within the University of Pittsburgh. And then like Dr. O'Donnell had mentioned, the reason for this is because um, although current uh, COA standards require ultrasound content within uh, nurse anesthesia program curriculum, it's likely that the majority of the practicing CRNAs in the country haven't attended a formalized uh, training curriculum during their uh, time in school. And then um, it's kind of like the case in UPMC too, where even though we've got over 500 CRNAs, um, the vast majority of them are probably most likely lacked formal ultrasound training. Um, so yeah, with the develop, development of my curriculum, I reviewed a bunch of content from the American Institute of Ultrasound uh, in Medicine or AIUM, um, their current, like their curriculum of, uh, for fundamentals of ultrasound physics and instrumentation. Um, and then I created a course uh, using, uh, uh, using the WISER platform. I created an online module, which included, um, like an online self-paced module, some check on learning slides to kind of reinforce key concepts. And then I also used um, like an evaluation uh, checklist um, that was uh, based off of some of the scales that I found on in the literature. And then, you know, I wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of this curriculum by evaluating each participant's pre and post course confidence, uh, their knowledge and how well they did um, with the curriculum and then also the like the usability of the course as well. Um, right, so there it is, the AIUM objectives. So let's see. All right, we could go on to the next slide, sir. Uh, right, so yeah, like, uh, like I said, um, I created my course through the WISER platform. It's on the uh, wiser uh, like course listings there. It used to be called the uh, concepts in ultrasound skills and procedures for advanced practice nurses, but I believe like Dr. O'Donnell said, it's being renamed to the advanced, sorry, the ultrasound uh, for advanced practice providers course. So then that way we can open it, not just to the CRNAs and SRNAs, but also to the other um, advanced practice disciplines as well, like the uh, nurse practitioners, acute care nurse practitioners. Um, so even though I had created this curriculum, my class was the COVID class and it was a bit of an anomaly. So fortunately I wasn't able to implement my project, um, but everything was laid out and it was carried out by another student. Uh, and we're very fortunate that uh, that other student is here to uh, update us, uh, Daryl. And so uh, let me, let me introduce her, Dr. Betsy Gajawa uh, is one of the graduates of our class of 2021. 
That's it. Thank you, Dr. O'Donnell. Um, yeah, I just graduated last December. Um, I'm currently living in Los Angeles, practicing at Cedar sinai Medical Center, um, Level 1 Trauma Center, Academic Medical Center. We practice under the care team model. It's actually interesting. Um, they just started using CRNAs in November of 2020. So it's been a little adjustment and um, it's kind of interesting to see the East Coast versus West Coast with the use of CRNAs. Uh, but we have 42 operating rooms and lots of different offsites. So definitely a big place to practice. Um, most commonly the CRNAs are using uh, ultrasound for A-line placement, peripheral IV placement, and uh, to kind of find landmarks and anatomy on patients we think will be difficult spinals. Um, we don't really do too many blocks there as CRNAs just because there's a lot of fellows and residents there on the regional team that kind of take care of those for us. Um, so like Daryl was saying, my project kind of picked up uh, where he left off. I actually used um, a lot of his basis of research, his, um, some of his PowerPoint, things like that to kind of pick up his project. So my project's official title was the implementation of an ultrasound training program to improve ultrasound knowledge and use among anesthesia providers. And basically what we were looking at was does implementing this program um, improve provider knowledge, confidence, and competence towards uh, actually improving the use of ultrasound in practice. So we know that ultrasound is essentially now research has shown the gold standard for regional anesthesia and being used a lot more for like vascular access and things like that. So we wanted to know if we improved knowledge and confidence, would that then turn into um, improved use in, in the clinical setting or in, um, you know, in the ORs as SRNAs and CRNAs? Uh, you can advance. So AIMS, we wanted to implement this program um, for SRNAs and CRNAs, and we did end up implementing it with uh, a majority of SRNAs with some CRNAs as well. Uh, and then we wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of the program uh, by looking at outcomes in provider confidence, knowledge, and skill performance. And we kind of went over those uh, in a couple different ways that I'll touch on. And then lastly, we wanted to see uh, some data on course utility and sustainability, uh, and if the course was, was helpful. Um, so methods, again, we designed and implemented the program. Like I said, a lot of it was based off of what uh, Daryl had already um, kind of come up with through his research. Uh, we wanted to look at knowledge. So we did a pre-course and a post-course course survey. I believe it was 21 questions. Or no, it was 15 questions. I'm sorry, the 21 is the skills checklist. Uh, 15 questions. So we had them take a baseline uh, and then use the didactic material that Daryl came up with and then uh, taught the actual course. And then we would have them do the uh, post-course knowledge uh, assessment as well. We also did a confidence survey, which kind of touched on five different areas of using ultrasound in clinical. And again, that was a pre and post kind of situation. Uh, in person, we had, we recruited, I think 19 total participants and kind of walked them through a, a review of the course and then walk them through a skills checklist that used the knobology and how to um, use different probes, how to work through just the basics of using the GE venue machine. Um, after everyone worked through the checklist, we had them use um, the ultrasound to find ideal images. We ended up capturing two images per participant. One was an image of like the right IJ common carotid artery area that you would most commonly use if you're trying to insert a central line. And then we had them use the interscaling approach to finding a picture of the brachial plexus. Each student took pictures of what they thought their ideal image was. And then we sent those off to uh, kind of two ultrasound experts, which again, thank you, Daryl, because you were one of those as well, um, to kind of grade those images and look for any correlation in any of those scores. Um, after that, we did a downstream assessment and kind of looked at how confidence improved and if, um, use in clinical improved. So again, we had 19 participants. I think it was 15 SRNAs and four CRNAs. We did see a statistically significant improvement in ultrasound knowledge and improvement in provider confidence. Uh, our checklist scores were super, super high. They were like out of 21 points, everyone averaged over 20. Um, interestingly, there were no correlation between checklist scores and image scores. Uh, we did see that there was no significant difference between SRNAs and CRNAs in any of the categories. So each um, saw improvement in knowledge and confidence. 
And then we had positive post-course evaluation scores, which showed improved provider confidence. And then downstream assessment showed improved provider use as well. And, and Betsy, just so that we're clear, um, it's really hard to get a, a significant correlation when their images were good and they also performed almost perfectly after they received the instruction, mm -hmm. right? At, when people perform perfectly, it's hard to core, like usually correlation are two different uh, uh, number sets with some variation. And when there's very little variation, it's hard to correlate, you know? Yeah, that's so, correct. So I, I think this is more an artifact of the effectiveness of the course than it is that there wasn't any correlation. Yeah, I would agree. And I think, you know, everyone that participated, uh, obviously, I think we were looking for the knowledge and confidence improvement. And, you know, just because this was such a, you know, course based on the basics of ultrasound, just getting used to having a probe in your hand and, yeah. you know, knowing how to kind of manipulate and find that optimal image was, was important. And then after the, you know, 19 people we used for recruited for the initial, um, project, we then went on to use it for the rest of the class of 2022 as well. And I would also note that even though people read about the knobology and had done the course, and even though they knew about the probes, actually using them, I noticed they weren't that familiar with it. So, uh, you know, I think that that knowing and doing domains is really a good learning for everyone who teaches any student anywhere. You know, just because you know it doesn't mean you can do it. I think we all know that's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, our next our next uh, presenter is Shawnez Morris. Dr. Mor Morris is going to graduate in December with the class of 2022. Shawnez. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for joining us here. I was actually fortunate enough to get some training from my time as a nurse at Cleveland Medical Center in the cardiac ICU, where I was the ultrasound guided IV champion there. So I decided to expand that into my DNP project and follow in some of the footsteps of the alumni that are here. So my project was entitled the use of ultrasound guided peripheral intravenous catheter insertion in perioperative adult populations to improve the knowledge, confidence, and skills of nurse anesthetists. So the purpose of my project was to allow CRNAs to just exemplify a higher level of comfort when using the ultrasound for vascular access in particular. So the literature that I reviewed for my project showed that despite having only a moderate degree of confidence, providers were more accurate in identifying vascular anatomy and performing ultrasound guided IV placement. So it was our overall goal to assess whether the implementation of a training protocol would improve the confidence and skills of CRNAs in this manner. The aims of my project were to develop a written and hands-on teaching component, which was distributed to the participating CRNAs. So I gave them reference materials that were presented before they got any hands-on training, which included the basics of ultrasonography and anatomy of the upper extremities. The hands-on training was completed to improve the familiarity and comfortability with the ultrasound device itself, which included some walkthroughs and adjustment of the features of the ultrasound, including depth and gain, along with addition of the guide component to increase their accuracy. It also included some topic information on identifying the vascular probe versus the other probes and orientation, as well as IV placement technique. And then we went ahead and distributed pre-surveys assessing the confidence with ultrasonography. And we did post-surveys after they went through the hands-on training component and after I actually watched CRNAs attempt around three IV insertions. We also assessed patient experience, which was evaluated with the use of a short survey that was administered to patients that were awake during the IV placement procedure in the pre-op holding area at Presby. So this was a quality improvement study with pre and post confidence assessments and patient surveys. The participants included the team of IV CRNAs who were a group of CRNAs at Presby that would come in a little bit early to help the pre-op nurses with IV starts for the beginning of the day and then the patients who were awake. Now, 
we only had seven CRNAs that completed demonstration of the minimum of the minimum of the three attempts and one CRNA was excluded because they did not finish both the pre and post survey and only a total of four patient surveys were completed as some of the patients were anesthetized in the OR by the time they had actually undergone the IV placement. So the provider pre-survey consisted of three open-ended items and they assessed the years the participant had been practicing as a nurse, how many times they have used the ultrasound for a clinical procedure and the number of times they had used an ultrasound specifically for an IV catheter. And just to spare everybody listening to all of the questions here, I'll only discuss the two questions that showed statistical significance, which question one was assessing whether or not the CRNA was confident in using the ultrasound in general for clinical procedures, and question two assessed confidence in using the ultrasound for placement of peripheral IV catheters. So those two were my statistically significant items there. And successful demonstration of ultrasound guided IV insertion was measured with the use of a skills checklist, which required three observed attempts. And here are the results from my four patient surveys. Um, this just kind of gave them a multiple choice for the first for the first question, which was their perceived attempts that they've had at getting an ultrasound or rather a peripheral IV placed in the past. So one out of four patients stated that they had one previous attempt. One out of four stated that they had two attempts in the past and half of the patients said that they had three to four previous attempts with IV placement before successful cannulation was achieved. Three out of four stated that ultrasound was more efficient for IV placements and all four stated that their Experience with ultrasound guided IV placement was a five on a Likert scale with five being the highest and all four preferred ultrasound guided IV placement in the future. So this project is actually being extended into other areas at UPMC Presbyterian. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the results will be following that. Well, thank you, Shanaz. And, um... Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, that was really interesting. And um, now we'll take any questions or comments from our audience. Sure. Um, so we had a comment from Brian who says that the GE machines um, that you spoke of um, provide excellent images, but the um, biology is more challenging than most. Um, it makes complete sense that the hands-on machine time is so helpful with that particular machine. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks, Brian. Um, you know, I, I think you're right. And um, Wiser, as I noted, just purchased five of the uh, Sonosite uh, really high-end machines with the uh, big wide. Uh, it's about, um, I would say it's about a 24 inch display um, and it's much more intuitive. Um, and we were just there for our national CRNA diversity meeting this past weekend. Um, and you could see the uh, participants who had zero experience pick it up really rapidly. So I agree with you. It's a good comment. Yeah, Daryl uh, commented and kind of reiterated what you just said, Dr. O'Donnell, um, in that it's, you know, it's good to have um, time with the students and with the machines as well. So, yeah. Um, I have a question. Do you, um, how do you feel that your time at Pitt and the nurse anesthesia program has influenced um, your careers or your, um, your focus or your career trajectories? I don't know if anyone wants to go first. <laughs> yeah, I, I can start. Um, I, I certainly think, as I kind of mentioned um, through my discussion, uh, my experience with ultrasound, both, um, you know, b before I got to anesthesia school as an engineer, and then certainly the time that I spent, you know, doing my, my DNP project and clinically with my block rotations there, I had a good block rotation. So um, going into practice after graduation and, uh, you know, being in a practice where the CRNAs are expected to be able to do the blocks and certainly do the blocks, 
um, it was extremely helpful. And, um, you know, it, it's just nice because it is in our scope of practice. And I feel like it's so many other institutions, you know, we don't have necessarily the opportunity yet. Hopefully that um, changes, but uh, it, it certainly helped uh, my confidence going in and, and like I said, kind of hit the ground running um, with that. And, and just being able to, you know, to have that skill set should I go and practice elsewhere, um, you know, that's something that I'll always take with me. Right, and then just to kind of go off of what Jared said, I think my time at Pitt um, really set me up to kind of handle whatever um, like challenges or work setting I'm placed in. So like I said, here in Pittsburgh, I work in an ACT um, practice, but when I'm away uh, practicing as an active duty seer and I'm fully independent, pre op in my patients, putting in my post-op orders, doing blocks, uh, managing a whole OB floor by myself. Um, I think definitely our clinical experience at Pitt um, and being able to use the tools that we have in our simulation centers, um, like with the GE Venue 50s, um, it's been pretty priceless. And I can kind of flip-flop from wherever, I, from wherever I'm working. Sean, has there Betsy any comments? Well, I'm not out there in, in the field yet, but yeah. I will say that my clinical experience here has been phenomenal. Throughout all the sites that I've been at, I've been in the UPMC system and outside of the UPMC system. So I've had exposure to more independent practice with my block rotation, as well as exposure to the VA and to Jefferson. And I actually love our simulation labs. And I was able to attend Betsy's class actually for the ultras ultrasound project that she did, which I thought was super helpful, as well as we actually have a little bit of ultrasound built into our curriculum. So all of those skills that are that we're getting exposed to now, I'm sure will be helpful in the future. And, and Maddie, I would say that we have very experienced um, attendees here tonight, um, some more than others. I see Don Yen and your is here and um, you know he was uh, one of my students during my early days as a program director when I looked a heck of a lot better uh, than I do now. Uh, but um, the, um, the challenge that we face and I would throw this out to our panelists as well as to our attendees, I think the big challenge we have right now is how do we get our students trained in point of care ultrasound? And uh, by that I mean things like evaluating the stomach to, as to whether or not it has food in it, um, looking at the lung uh, to see if there are potentially pneumothoraces or some other types of uh, problems, you know, airway evaluations, um, cardiac evaluations, things like that, because uh, A, it's not common in CRNA practice, at least locally, and B, um, B we need to make sure every student uh, who started this past January uh, has those experiences, but of course we want all of our students now to be gaining them. So um, any advice, and I'd be really happy to hear it. Awesome. Has that, because of COVID, has there been a, a slowdown in the hands-on clinical um, experiences that current students should no, no, no. We, we love to hear that. Yeah, we, we had a uh, three month. Uh, uh, so who asked the question? Oh, I, I just did. Just oh, me, did. just uh, for my, did. Own, my own curiosity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just so everyone knows we had a, th um, when, when COVID hit, um, of course, every program in the country was stunned. And um, uh, uh, because of, all the concern for PPE, that was the main driver. And also for the safety of our students, we had to stop clinical for three months. Uh, so that, Daryl, was your class, I believe, correct? Correct, sir. Yeah, and also, Betsy, I think your class sat out. Yes, we had just started. I think we were in clinical for like two months before we got kicked out for three. Right. And so the challenge then was, what do we do now 
and how long will this last and when can we get back in? Uh, but we were at the mercy of the pandemic. Uh, so we tried to do as much as we could during that period of time and working on projects and in accomplishing things in the classroom. Um, but uh, we then retransitioned back after three months. And when we had enough PPE to do it, uh, there were challenges in getting all the students in 95 mask fitted, of course, and things like that. And then, um, and then even while we did not have very much transmission, um, uh, I think perhaps one case of transmission at a clinical site from one student to another during lunch, uh, that's throughout the pandemic, we certainly had lots and lots of students have COVID and, and lots of faculty and, and et cetera. And so just maintaining program momentum during all of that has been a real challenge. But uh, for Daryl's class, we flexed a little bit and we said that because of three months, that's about a hundred cases. So we, we changed the threshold from 800 to 700. But, but for Betsy's class, um, we were able to make up the time. And so all of them met the 800 case threshold that we've established in our program. And for Sharnaz's class, uh, that's not gonna be a problem at all. Uh, but uh, the, the, the entire thing has been a mess and uh, a, a significant challenge. Uh, and I don't think any of us will be, be um, the same ever again. I doubt that we'll go back to a true normal. Yeah, absolutely. Always adjustments. Um, but, but I mean, I'd love to hear from the students who experienced it. Maybe, I, maybe my perception is wrong. Maybe they have different opinions. So uh, Daryl and Shanaz and Betsy, any thoughts on that? I'll say that my class started our clinicals at the tail end of 2020, and we didn't really experience any delay. And we actually, in preparation for being pulled out of clinical in the future, if it were to occur, we started at 12 hour shifts, which was a little bit different than the other classes, but that was all to ensure that we got our hours and cases in, and we've been able to maintain that ever since. So I don't think it's going to be an issue for us moving forward. Like, Dr. O'Donnell said. That's my help. That's my help for sure. Yeah, I would agree. The only thing I think that changed for us, uh, like Shanaz just touched on, was just, you know, a little bit longer of shifts at times. But I don't feel like, at least personally, and the, you know, the people I was close with in the program felt like crunched for getting cases. I think we all kind of met our numbers uh, earlier rather than later, which was, you know, reassuring. And Daryl, your and Daryl, your class was out at a very, a very key point because you were close to graduation. So I know that was stressful. Right. It's a good thing I had uh, good mentors in Jared's class, and they kind of, you know, pushed me hard early and told me to get my crannies and my hearts early in the program. So towards the end, I really didn't have to play catch up very much. Yeah. That's good. yeah. Yeah, it's always it's such a weird time, but it sounds like you have, we've all made the nurse anesthesia program and department has made adjustments in order to keep things as normal as they possibly can be in these, dare I say, uncertain times. <laughs> um, all right, so there is a another question about um, the position statements of um, the AANA and ASA, um, particularly regarding. Um, you know, as you said, Dr. O'Donnell, the diagnosing of the um, empty stomachs, if they endorse that or if they don't, um, and if um, there is room for students to help build on um, standards within um, the hospital settings or clinical settings, I guess, too. Uh, well, the ANA position on ultrasound, they have a white paper posted online and in the white paper, they, they acknowledge the problem for nurse anesthetists, which is that point of care ultrasound is diagnostic in, large, in many cases. And, um, and um, CRNAs, depending on where you practice, may or may not have the practice right to do a diagnosis. So, um, the way they describe it is the use of ultrasound uh, for decision support, for clinical decision-making, 
and things like that when you're evaluating the stomach or any other organ. And that if there's some issue that needs diagnosed, if you're in a state that there's no diagnosis capability for the CRNA, that you then consult appropriately. I, I would say that's more or less the ANA statement. I think the ASA is in large part against practice expansion by CRNAs. So, uh, you know, that has not changed in my um, uh, 31 years of being a CRNA. Okay, awesome. Um, and then a final question is for our panelists. Um, if you could offer one piece of advice, um, you know, to either your former self as you went through your pit education, what would that piece of advice be? Um, so I, I guess I can go first. Um, yeah, go ahead. One piece um, of advice, and, and, and I got this kind of before I started and um, try to kind of follow it throughout my clinical experience. Um, and that was just to kind of just go in every day with an open mind and, um, you know, just kind of pick up little bits and pieces from every CRNA, every provider that you're with, um, whether it's something that you really like about their practice and that you want to incorporate into your practice, or if it's something that you say, you know, I definitely don't want to do this, then that's fine too. But all of those experiences will help mold the kind of provider that you become. So, um, yeah, just take up every experience that you can get, um, soak it all up, um, get out of your comfort zone and, um, you know, take any opportunity that comes your way. Like Daryl was saying, well, you know, if you get out and you're in a position where you're practicing independently, like we practice at one of our hospitals in Titusville independently, those experiences that you have in school um, will certainly help you um, become more confident and, and, and a better provider and, you know, be, be able to provide those care to that, those patients, um, you know, in an independent, uh, you know, care setting. So definitely just, just take every, every experience you can. Um, and uh, yeah, don't skip out on anything. Yeah, I would piggyback off of that as well and just, you know, say, especially as a student, like that is your time to ask the questions, to ask to see things, to ask to, you know, use a different blade, um, to use ultrasound, even if you don't think you're going to need ultrasound for an A-line, just that's your time to practice, that's your time to learn, and especially with the new PMC, there are so many CRNAs and attending anesthesiologists that want to teach and want to show you new things or new ways. So um, it's really, you know, you, you know, you're going to be there for your shift. So just ask the questions and no question is a silly question. Um, it's really your turn to capitalize on, on what everyone else around you can teach you and the knowledge base that we've learned in, you know, didactic and carry it out in clinical. Right, definitely. Like as a student, you're kind of put in a bunch of uh, like uncomfortable situations, but I always feel like experience is the best teacher. So, you know, just go in motivated every day. I know sometimes uh, it's rough. You have your ups and downs uh, in school, but it's just important to kind of remember why you're there um, and then just make the best out of your time because it goes by really quick. <laughs> Yeah, I think just to piggyback off of what everyone said, is just don't be afraid to seek out those experiences and to ask questions. And just now is the time to learn. And that's something I find myself telling the underclassmen is now is your time to learn. You have plenty of CRNAs and attendings around you to take advice from and get their take on things from. So just kind of soak it all in, like Jared said, and add that to your own practice or don't depending on what it is, but it's all valuable information. That's wonderful. Thank you all so very much for sharing your, your research and your time um, with us tonight. I know um, it's really great to hear success stories and you all have are definitely one of the stars of the um, nurse anesthesia program, as I'm sure Dr. O'Donnell would agree. <laughs> um, 
So thank you all um, so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking um, the time to um, you know, join us this evening for this presentation. Um, like Dr. O'Donnell said, this is being recorded, so it'll be um, uploaded if there are any, uh, if you would like to um, focus it on any of the research that our panelists did, um, it'll be uploaded shortly. Um, are there any other closing remarks by any of our wonderful panelists or our host, Dr. O'Donnell? <laughs> Uh, well, I'll just take the opportunity to thank our alumni. And uh, we've had um, tremendous support from our alumni over the years. Uh, because of that support, our students will be able to go to the ANA Annual Congress this year and uh, do so with, if not a full, a full scholarship, at least substantial money towards their, their time at that, in my opinion, very important meeting. And um, also, just to, to our alumni, if there's anything you need, you know, I think uh, I see Abby uh, Carlson is here. I just interacted with her today. Um, so if there's anything you need, you know, as always, we'll try to uh, turn it around rapidly and um, especially for your credentialing and other things that are so important. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try to make sure we address that right away. And, and so you don't have to chase things down. I know how frustrating that could be. And um, you know we don't want to be like that as a program. We want to be responsive. So uh, thanks to all of you. Thank you so much to our panelists. I'm so proud of all of you. And um, you know I think that this thread of ultrasound education is going to continue, and it's going to be stronger here. And uh, we're going to develop the educational materials to really um, make ongoing impact both for our students and and most importantly for the patients that our graduates care for as they move out into the profession. So thanks so much, Maddie, for setting this up. Yes, of course. Um, to all of the, um, uh, I just put my email in the chat. Hopefully you all have been able to see it. But if like Dr. O'Donnell said, if there's anything that you um, need, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help. Um, and we hope to see some of you in Chicago for our alumni mixer. Um, yeah. We're really excited to be back in person and see some of you all. So um, yeah. once again, happy. That'll be, on, that'll be on Saturday night at? The Northman Beer and Cider Garden. Right. It's at right on the water, at, so it'll at, be at six, beautiful. At 6, at 6 p.m., I believe, correct? I believe so, yes. Yeah, so if any of you are going to the meeting, please join us. It's a great event, and we'll get a chance to have a little camaraderie in person. Yes, absolutely. We're excited to be back and traveling and back in person, semi-normal semi stuff. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you once again to our panelists and for everyone for joining. Um, have a wonderful rest of your night. Um, and hail to Pitt. Hail to Pitt.